It is a pleasure to be back with you today. I uh, used to sit in the back row when Dr. Johnson was preaching here as a seminary student, so I have just fond memories of this special place. I'm turning our attention this morning to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 1. I'd like to especially consider verses 16 and 17. Uh, They are often called the theme verses of the epistle to the Romans. To understand them, I want to uh, read beginning at verse 8 so that we have the context, and then we will conclude our reading at verse 17. So then, please hear the reading of God's holy and infallible word beginning at verse 8 of Romans chapter 1. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Thus far the reading of God's word. May he bless it to our souls. Amen. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning, and I see you have a new pastoral staff member. Uh, We need to have him stand up and say amen real loudly. Would you do that? Amen. All right. So now I can say I got at least one amen out of Believer's Chapel for my sermon. I didn't get any this morning at the early service, so I got at least one, right? (laughs) Jeff, so good to see you, and God bless you and your new calling. Great. Okay. Well, today we're going to be looking at uh, the verse that brought Martin Luther into the presence of God and launched, in a very real way, the Protestant Reformation. Now, we know that when we look at life, we measure things by milestones in time. As a parent and grandparent... There's something very magical about a first birthday. I can remember being at my new first granddaughter's first birthday, and it was magical. I said, what an amazing thing. You know, you just can't help it. And then I think through raising my daughters, the 16th birthday, the 18th birthday, the 21st birthday. And yes, this uh, last year, my 65th birthday. I'm now a senior citizen. And uh, Medicare is knocking on my door telling me we're going to take really good care of you now that you're a senior citizen. Major events in life are measured by time. And so it's no surprise that there are certain dates that ring through our minds and we know instantly what they are. Even if you're not a historian, there are certain dates you say, I know what that is. How about 1492? You know that, right? We from Philadelphia like 1776. Have you heard of the 76ers? Okay. Uh, How about this? 1945 or 2001. Well, 2017, just a few months ago on October 31st, commemorates a very important year in the life of the Protestant faith. 1517, October 31st was the day when Martin Luther went to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany, and he nailed his 95 theses to that door. He was an obscure monk talking about a very obscure point of theology, and he had no idea that what he was doing was going to shake the world. God chose to let that act be the first 
domino to fall in an unbroken chain of events that reaches right here today to this moment. 1517, October 31st, is the reason that there is a Westminster Theological Seminary. It's a reason that there is a believer's chapel. The Protestant faith was unwittingly born when Luther started to address the question, can a person really give money to the church to find a way to get into heaven? It just made so much sense. That was the franchise of the Roman Catholic Church. They ruled the world of Europe. They were able to establish the means and the bargaining chips by which the doors of heaven would open from purgatory. And yet, when Luther began to struggle over the issue of how does a person become right with God, everything changed. And the way that that changed is because of the text we're going to study today. As a result of his coming to understand the word that we will read and study, the great Protestant mottos came into being. I know you know them. Scripture alone. Grace alone. Christ alone. Faith alone. Glory to God alone. The priesthood of the believer sometimes will add other phrases like all of Scripture or always reforming. This approach toward the Christian life was something that God opened to this wonderful reformer named Martin Luther. Now let me assure you, he was not a perfect man and he knew it and he knew he needed a savior. But once he discovered the ability to look at the world from God's word, everything changed, including the church that he had been a very loyal son of. I like this text that comes from one of his sermons in 1539. It shows us how he began to apply Sola Scriptura. He looked at something that was universally understood throughout the church, even as it is today. The need for people to be baptized to become Christians. It's part of the Christian faith. We don't call ourselves believers without being baptized into Christ one way or another. We debate about its form and what it might mean. But this is the way Luther put it. Look at baptism. It is water. Where does the hallowing and the power come from? From the Pope? No, it comes from God, who says, he who believes and is baptized, in Mark 16, 16. For the Pope puts trust in the consecrated water. Why do you do this, Pope? Who gave you the power? The church? Well, yes, indeed. The church may have given you this power, but where do you find that written in the Bible? Nowhere. Therefore, the consecrated water is Satan's goblin bath. If you're a student of German, he called it a kobobod. It is the Satan's goblin bath, which cripples, blinds, and consecrates the people without the word. But in the church, one should teach and preach nothing besides or apart from the word of God. For the pastor who does the baptizing says, it is not I who baptize you. I am only the instrument of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is not my work. Now listen, when you start calling the Pope's baptism Satan's goblin bath, you're in trouble. But Luther was unafraid to do that. Because he said, you say, you, through your word, have made this water saving. And that's why people are going to be saved. He said, the Bible does not say that. Thus says the Lord. The authority of Scripture was what changed everything for Luther. Understanding its message and applying it revolutionized his understanding of the, his own salvation. And as a result, the Protestant movement was born. Now, in 1545, Luther spoke about the verse that we're going to study today. And he said that this is the place in Paul which for me truly opened the gate to paradise. Here I was altogether born again. Luther said, I became a born again Christian, studying Romans 1, 16 and 17. Maybe that suggests we should know these verses pretty well too. Because here is where what we celebrate every Sunday, the authority of the word of God, 
preaching of the word took root in the one God used to begin to restore the church to the image of the word of God. Now, my remarks today are going to be made under four thoughts. Uh, the points will not be symmetrical. Some will be quite long and some will be quite short. And so, Jeff, do not grade me down for that, okay? He's seated right on the front row. I know he's taken score there, so I'm in trouble. Okay. First point, Romans 1, 16 and 17. It presents the Reformation biblically, beginning with Paul, 1,500 years before Luther. A millennium and a half beforehand, the Reformation principles were right there in Paul's teaching. Secondly, we're going to look how this passage, 500 years before us, brought the Reformation into existence, how it launched the Reformation through Luther. Thirdly, we're going to consider Romans 1, 16 and 17 about how it continues the Reformation at this very moment in this very service. And then finally, fourthly, we're going to consider how Romans 1, 16 and 17 points the way forward to the distant Reformation celebration of the future. If the Lord tarries, there will be a Reformation 1000 because of these verses because of these truths. So let's look again at the passage that we're considering today. Uh, let me read again for you Romans 1, 16 and 17. The scriptures say, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, and is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, if you heard me read, I sought to emphasize the word for in each of three instances. The word for here is not F-O-U-R, the number, but F-O-R meaning the reason for something, the cause of something, the explanation for something. In the Greek language, it's the word gar, G-A-R, and it's, it's, it's giving us the reason why something is true. And so in verse 16, he says, I'm going to give you the reason why I so long to go to Rome to be with you Christians, to preach to you, to have fruit with you, to see the blessings of the church in the epicenter of the Roman Empire. He says, I want to preach there. I am undaunted by the power of the emperor. I'm not frightened by the plethora of religions and false ideologies and temples. I'm not afraid of persecutors like the Jewish community that may stand against me. I want to go to Rome. Why? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, of the good news of Jesus Christ. He is telling us that his commitment to the gospel is something that will take him right into the heart of where there might be the greatest opposition because he's unashamed. You know what you're unashamed of? You're quite willing to be open about. When you're ashamed of something, you seek to hide. You stand back and don't want anyone to know. You know what, this year I'm not ashamed of the Philadelphia Eagles for some reason. <laughs> They've actually won some games this year. It's amazing. Okay. Paul says, I'm not ashamed. Why? Because it is good news. It is the euangelion. It is the great message of good things, great tidings of joy that shall be to all people. He says the Christmas story and the resurrection and the saving of sinners from the judgment of God. It's such good news. I want everybody to see I'm identified with it. That's why I want to go to Rome. Because I believe somehow even Romans who are anti-Christianity are going to come to faith. Paul might have thought maybe someday even the Roman emperor might come to faith. He wanted the gospel to go there. For, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, but then he says, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The second for now explains why he's not ashamed. The first four explains why I want to go to Rome and preach. Why are you going? Because you're not ashamed. Well, why are you not ashamed, Paul? For it is the power, the dunamis, 
the dynamite, the dynamo of God for the salvation to everyone who believes. He said, I'm not ashamed to preach this gospel because it's dynamic. It has power within it. It has the ability to explode obstacles and keep on moving. It's something that changes lives and will change the world. It's a dynamo, dunamis. I don't know if you've happened to see that movie of Winston Churchill called The Darkest Hour. It's worth seeing. Uh, If you uh, see the scene in your mind, or if you haven't, it goes like this. It's at a moment where 300,000 British troops are stranded on the beach, and the great war machine of the German Third Reich are crushing them, and they're ready to be utterly destroyed or have to surrender. This is the army of the United Kingdom utterly unable to escape. And there was a plan that was hatched by a courageous man named Winston Churchill, the only one that had the courage to see it. He said, we are not going to surrender our army. We're going to ask all the ships of every private citizen in England that can sail to go and take those men home. And believe it or not, they rescued 300,000 men. The people rescued the army so that the army later could rescue the people. It's an extraordinary story. Now, what's interesting is that Churchill says, we need a name for this operation. And there just happened to be a big engine right next door in the scene. At least this is the way the movie suggests it. Its name was Dynamo. Guess what the operation was called? Operation Dynamo. A powerful engine for a powerful rescue mission. But this is what the gospel is. It's God's powerful engine for the great rescue of souls. It is God's redeeming, saving purpose in history. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's powerful. There's no soldier that's ashamed of his tank. There's no race car driver that's ashamed of his huge engine that lets him win the race. There's no athlete that's ashamed of his powerful physique that lets him take on the team opposed to him. Paul says, I am not ashamed of this good news because it has the power to make an impact on the world. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it saves, it rescues people when they are helplessly pinned in against death by an enemy that will take them to their destruction. That's the good news. I'm not ashamed. Now, Paul gives yet a third four, and is the second reason that he's not ashamed. The first four says, this is why I'm going to Rome to preach. I'm not ashamed. The second four says, the reason I'm not ashamed is because it's the power of God unto salvation. The third four explains, if you will, further why he's not ashamed. For in it, in this good news, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because here something no man can ever know is made knowable. It's revealed. The word in the original is actually what we often call the last book of the New Testament. The book of Revelation. The Greek word is apocalypsis. The apocalypse, the unveiling of that which is hidden. It's like when you go to a Broadway play and you're seated there and the curtains are closed and you're saying, I wonder what's going to come. And then the curtains open up and all of a sudden you see the scene and the actors and it's all revealed to you what the play is going to be. And you begin to be engaged. Paul says that in this good news, the hiddenness of God's purposes are suddenly opened up and we get to see them. They are revealed. And what is revealed is what no man could ever know. That is, how can you line up rightly with the very nature of God? How is it possible that sinners who are in rebellion to God, broken and blind and spiritually unable, can be attuned to the very nature of the ultimate judge of their souls, the creator of the universe? The good news tells us what we could never know because God has told it to us. He's unveiled it. And the good news says, sinner, broken person, crooked person, darkened mind and soul, 
Here's how light can make you whole, how it can shape your life to the very nature of God. This is good news. I'm not ashamed of it because it's powerful. It changes people. It changes history. It changes lives. I'm not ashamed of this. Why? Because it tells us what we could never know in any other way. It is a rightness with God. And amazingly, it's not by how hard we work or how good we are. But we start by faith. We just believe it. And the deeper we go in our lives, we continue to believe. It's from faith and for faith. Have you noticed that Believer's Chapel doesn't have a program that says when you come here, you start as a believer, but once you join the church, you're a Good Works Chapel member. You never get beyond believing. None of us do. You believe unto a deeper faith. Now, that's not to suggest that where our lives don't change. Of course they do. But what it means is we never can get beyond our need to receive what God alone can tell us, what God alone can do for us. We believe what God has said, and that is according to God's word. It is from faith for faith as it is written. You hear the ring of scripture, sola scriptura? The written, the righteous shall live by faith. People who measure their lives and saying, you know what, I am learning to live the right way. I'm learning to live in conformity with God's nature. I want to be a righteous person. Guess what? It's only possible because of faith. Even the righteous person lives by faith. You never get beyond the lesson of faith. You only deepen your trust and what God has given us. Now, what I've just described here, as I said, is the theme of the epistle to the Romans. It's actually a very easy text if you just pay attention to what's here. But Martin Luther didn't know it. He didn't understand it. In fact, the church he came from had thrown a blanket over it and had changed the system entirely. They had a work system of called penance, where you satisfied for your sins by doing something good. In fact, the way the gospel was summarized was like this. God does not withhold grace to those who do the best they can. Now, in honor to Dr. Johnson, who is one of my scholarly professors, I'll say that in Latin just to show you I did become a scholar thanks to him. Faciendibus quad in se est Deus non de negat gratiam. Anybody want to quote that back? Okay, you don't have to. That's what it, what it basically says. God does not hold, withhold grace to those who do the best they can. What that means simply is that God grades on a curve. Dr. Waltke, you may remember him. He has preached here, and he's a friend. I had him as a professor, and uh, every once in a while, I have the joy of connecting with him. And uh, I was with your good friend, Mike Black, and he was reminding me of a class that he was in with Dr. Waltke. And the, the final exam was given, and the highest score on the exam was 45, which happened to be an A. Do you realize 45 is failing? How did you get an A? Well, that's called the, the bell curve, grading on a curve. 45 was really amazing. Most people got less than that. And so this was the idea in medieval theology. Nobody can really live up to the standard of Mary or the apostles, or the great saints. And God knows that. So all he asks us to do is to do the very best we can. And when we've done our best, God will take all the righteousness of the saints, and of the apostles, and of Mary, and the martyrs, and he will round it up to make it good enough to pass. Isn't that a gracious system? It makes a lot of sense. The only problem is that Martin Luther said, I never know if I've done my best. He said, I know I've fasted the, so hard, but what if I'd fasted a little bit more? I know I pray faithfully, but could I have prayed a couple more minutes or more intensely? I know I beat myself to bring myself under subjection so I won't be lusting and tempted. What if I'd done it just a little bit more? 
What if I'd done my penance with just a little more vigor and love? How do I know I've done my best? And he never could be sure. And so that system of God does not withhold grace to those who do their best created a terror, an anger, an uncertainty. In fact, a hatred for God in the heart of the medieval monk, Martin Luther. So as we look at the second point now, we've looked at Paul 1,500 years before Luther. The gospel so clear. Now, 500 years before us, Luther, he doesn't know it. And he tells us, as we've said in 1545, that this passage opens his eyes to this good news. And yet it was not an easy thing. He writes, I had indeed been captivated with an extraordinary ardor for understanding Paul and the epistle to the Romans. But up till then, it was not cowardice in my heart. But a single word in chapter 1, quote, in it the righteousness of God is revealed, end of quote. That is what stood in my way from studying this passage. For I hated that word, righteousness of God. Because it was taught to me by the custom of all of our teachers to understand it in a philosophical way as God's active righteousness by which God punishes unrighteous sinners. He said, I didn't want to study the righteousness of God because I knew God was going to be saying to me, Luther, you are unrighteous and I'm going to punish you and you deserve it. He said, I was terrified. I was struggling. And yet he is now a doctor in the church. His responsibility is to study the scriptures and teach it. He said, though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my works of satisfaction. I did not love. Yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. And secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God and said, as if indeed it is not enough that miserable sinners, eternally lost through original sin, are crushed by every kind of calamity, by the Ten Commandments and the law. And then on top of this, God adds pain to pain by the gospel. And in the gospel threatens us with his righteousness and wrath. Thus I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. He said, I hated this text. I hated God. I did everything I could, and there was no relief for me. He says, nevertheless, I beat importunately upon Paul at that place, most ardently desiring to know what St. Paul wanted. Now let me pause there in those words. Do you remember the important widow in Jesus' parable? There's the unjust judge who doesn't care about anybody, and she just keeps knocking on the door saying, sooner or later, someone's going to open this door. I'm not giving up. That becomes Luther's model of biblical interpretation. He says, when you come to the Bible, just do not read it. Stand there and knock on that verse. Keep knocking on the door. Keep knocking until finally God will open up that door and its truth will come to greet you. That's a beautiful image. This is what God wants us to do with the word. It's not to read it like a novel where you're just flipping page after page, but to labor and linger and study the text. Knock on it, not willing to leave it until its meaning comes to be your very own heart's blessing. This is what he did. Notice how he puts it. At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night. You realize he says, I spent days agonizing over this verse. I hated being there. I didn't want to study it, but I had to. And I kept agonizing. What does it mean? What's God saying? And he said, I gave heed to the context of the words, namely, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed as it is written. He, through faith, is righteous, shall live. There, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely by faith. 
And this is the meaning. The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel, namely the passive righteousness with which merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, he through faith is righteous shall live. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open doors. There a totally other face of the entire scripture showed itself to me. Here Luther gives us a very important distinction. He says there is this active righteousness of God, the righteousness by which God acts perfectly. His nature is free from sin. He always does what is right and holy. But there is not just an active righteousness that we are called to deal with, but there becomes what he calls a passive righteousness or an alien righteousness. There is the righteousness of another that comes to us as a gift. An alien is someone who's outside of the boundaries. Strange, it's, does not, it's not internal, it's outside. It's from another. And he said, I came to realize there's a righteousness from another that comes to me through faith. That other is Jesus Christ crucified and risen and received by faith. He said, here in receiving this great gift of the righteousness that in which I was passive, which Christ was active in, but it's an alien righteous, now mine by faith. He said, I extolled my sweetest word with a love as great as the hatred with which I had before hated the word righteousness of God. It's with this insight that Luther begins to question everything. Herman Selderhaus is a Dutch theologian. He's written a marvelous new uh, study on Luther. Uh, I heard him speaking recently at a conference in Jakarta, Indonesia, where I was with him. And he said, you know, the Reformation is a lot like the roads here in Jakarta. There's all these big U-turns you have to make to get to the other side of the road. And he said, that's what Luther did. He created the U-turn. Everything was based upon doing what you can, aiming and charging and struggling to get to the goal. And he realized you can't meet God that way. He simply realized that grace called him to do a U-turn and come and realize I can never make it. But God welcomes you with what you can never achieve. That God gives the gift of saving grace through faith. And with that in mind, Luther begins to critique everything he knew. The 95 Theses, this great document, October 31st, 1517, just a few months ago, 500 years. It begins with these first two principles. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. This word cannot be understood as referring to the sacrament of penance, that is, confession and satisfaction as administered by the clergy. Luther is going back to the Bible and he's saying, I studied the word repentance, repent. And it doesn't mean in the original, do penance. This idea that you have to satisfy God by making up for your wrong with all kinds of good works, that's not what it means. Repentance means to turn from your sin. And you do it as a believer. A believer always lives by repentance. It's his faith that brings him the righteousness and the courage to turn from what's wrong to please God. And so you see now the whole church's system has been thrown on its head. A U-turn has happened. He says, now I'm going to pursue things God's way. And so he begins to look at the practice of paying money to get out of purgatory. Number 27. By the way, this morning I said if Dan Duncan had given me 95 minutes to preach today, I couldn't get through all 95 theses. So I can only give you a few examples. Number 27, they preach only human doctrines who say that as soon as the money clinks into the money chest, the soul flies out of purgatory. Okay, you can hear Johann Tetzel here. His jingle rhymes in English and German. It says, as soon as the coin in the coffer clinks, a soul from purgatory into heaven springs. He said, no, that's a human doctrine. That's not in the Bible. He says in 28, it is certain that when money clinks in the money chest, greed and avarice can be increased. 32, 
Those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be eternally damned together with their teachers. Oh, my goodness. You see why Luther got in trouble with the church? He is literally like Christ overturning the money changers' tables, saying, this has nothing. And if you believe this, you are going to judgment because you've lost the gospel. This is not what will save you. And as a result, he begins to even pry a little bit more. I love what he says in number 86. Again, why does not the Pope, whose wealth is today greater than the wealthiest man in history, build this one basilica of St. Peter with his own money, rather than with the money of poor believers? Do you hear his logic? He's saying, the Pope wants to build St. Peter's Basilica. He needs lots of money to do it. But he's already the richest man in the world. And he has the power to forgive people. Why is he forcing children to go to bed hungry because their food money was spent on indulgences? Why is he taking their shoes and their blankets away from them in a cold winter so they can buy indulgences for giving money to the wealthiest man in the world? Why doesn't he just freely forgive them all and use his own money to build his building? What kind of selfishness is this? If he can forgive, then why doesn't he do it? Why does he make people buy it? Well, you know what? When you begin to mess with someone's bottom line, you get their attention. And they begin to say, why is the gold not flowing from Germany into Italy anymore? And they traced it down to a man named Martin Luther. And you can see why they were declared him a heretic. Why could he not recant? Because he said, I am just simply teaching the Bible. This is what the scriptures teach. This is the gospel. Well, what does this story mean for us today? A story of rediscovery of the gospel by Luther, simply finding the Apostle Paul's teaching of the gospel of grace through faith in Christ. Well, it brings us to our third point, which we will handle very pointedly but quickly. And that is, this Reformation continues today, right here in this church. Is it not true that this congregation proclaims the gospel of Christ alone, by faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone, through grace alone, through Scripture alone, to God's glory alone, that God alone is the one that saves us? Of course. But I would ask this question. Are we like Luther and like Paul? He said, I'm not ashamed of this gospel. Could it be possible that you're quite willing to come to a worship service, to hear about the gospel and even believe it for an hour or so on Sunday? But once you leave this place, no one will ever know that this gospel is important to you. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Does the gospel relish your soul and you relish its message and you share it with others? Boldness in proclaiming the gospel means that we are really embracing the Reformation. I believe, Paul says, therefore I have spoken. Paul, Luther believed and they spoke. And so must we. I recently had an opportunity to meet uh, with a man who is helping me with some clothing. I, I, I can't afford to go to a tailor. I'm just a poor preacher. But someone gave me a gift. Of a, a, they looked at my clothes and said, they're looking pretty shabby, Pete. We're going to get you a new suit. Isn't that, isn't that nice? Okay, maybe Pastor Duncan needs a new suit and you could give him one. I don't know. I didn't look at his suit today. So anyway, I thought, you know, I'm going to be with this man for several minutes as close as you can get to anybody else. He's going to be measuring me and doing all this stuff. And I thought, how am I going to tell him about Jesus? Will I be ready to tell him that I'm a Christian, that I'm a preacher? And two thoughts came to my mind. I brought a Bible with me, and I had a, a marker in that chapter in the Minor Prophet. Do you remember the story of the high priest who's in filthy garments and needs new clothes? I said, you know, you put new clothes on people who need to be spruced up. I want to tell you about one who can put new clothes upon your soul so you can be right with God. I marked the passage. I said, you got to read it. 
So I gave it to him. Now I had to go back. When I came back, I said, did you read? He said, yes, I read it. I said, you know, I, I had something else I thought about. I was in my closet looking at the suits, some I can't wear anymore, for somehow I've not only grown in grace, but I've grown in some other ways. <laughs> you know, there's those lovely old suits, you know, not being used. Maybe I have, I, I live by hope. Maybe I'll be able to wear them again someday. Okay. But as I was looking across the suits on, on the uh, rack, it occurred to me, so you know, one of those might be the ones they bury me in. And I'm going to go and remind this unbelieving tailor who's making me this new suit. He said, you know, you might be making my suit in which I'm going to be buried in. But you know what? You're going to be buried too. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and being the best tailor in the world, but he loses his own soul? You need to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to know I'm not the greatest evangelist, but I knew I had an opportunity to meet someone, and I wanted the gospel to shine. I did not want to be ashamed of the gospel. Are you ashamed of the gospel? You believe it. You're a believer's chapel. But are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you still convinced of its power to save? That this is God's dynamic gift to change the direction of lives, to give them a new goal, a new heart. Are you convinced that you live not to achieve your goals, to advance your portfolio, to achieve fame and renown, and all the things that come with being really excellent in your field? But you've not forgotten what the shorter catechism says. What is the chief end of man? It's to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone is to be the glory. So as we wrap up our study today, what have we said? First of all, the gospel is very clear. Romans 1, 16 and 17 is just so simple. When you look at it, its message is unmistakable. It was lost. Luther didn't know it, and he had to rediscover it. But when he discovered it, it exploded in his life. And he didn't intend to do anything but just trust God. But the U-turn that he did changed his world because it had so many implications that touched everything else. The dominoes kept falling. The whole culture was built on meriting something in the church, having the right to give you salvation. And the new freedom of understanding the Bible and believing God created the Western civilization and all of its blessings that we know, including the birth of America, that came about in a whole new beginning. That's for another series of lectures for another day. But that does then raise the issue. Yes, the Reformation is alive here. But is it fully alive? And that is my last point then. Romans 1, 16, 17 points the way forward to Reformation 1000. I can say one prophetic thing for sure. You know, well, you need to be careful about date setting. But I can give you one firm date. When Reformation 1000 comes, what year will that be? Let's see, that'd be 2517. You will not be here unless it's in a resurrected body. You can count on that, okay? Uh, you can write that right in your notes and say, Lilbeck says, I won't be here for Reformation 1000 unless the Lord comes and he still wants to celebrate the Reformation. Otherwise, we're not going to be there. But will the Reformation be there? And the answer is absolutely yes. Because heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word abides forever. And there are those, I believe some here, and I hope all of us here, who not only believe it, but we're not ashamed of it. We're convinced it is the power of God to the glory of God, and we're going to share it with others. We're going to proclaim it to others. We are going to advance its message in this world. And God is going to graciously pass this gospel truth on to the farthest generations until the Lord himself comes. Now, isn't it amazing that 500 years after Luther, he still remembered? So very few things get remembered. I fully expect that none of us will be remembered in 500 years from now. But the gospel we cherish will be remembered because it is the power of God. How is it going to happen? Well, as we wrap it up, I was very struck by a passage that I read from Dr. D. James Kennedy, the 
late Presbyterian minister from Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. He had written an article uh, and a sermon, and he quoted something that really struck me very deeply. And if I can find it, I'll read that quote to you. Just give me a second here. And maybe I picked up the wrong book, but I don't think I did. Okay, here we go. Jeff, don't mark me down for that, okay? All right. Here's what it says. I remember a story about a small church out in the boonies of the Soviet Union in their heyday. In the midst of a service attended by about 100 people, suddenly there was a crash as four soldiers kicked in the front door and stomped down to the front of the church with machine guns turned on the congregation. They said, you filthy Christians, you are the offscouring of the earth. You are a plague on the glorious atheistic society of the Soviet Union, and you are going to die today. You are not fit to live. You are a blotch on our glorious motherland. However, there may be some among you who are not here because you believe this foolish nonsense, and we will give you one minute to get out of this building. It was silent. Then suddenly the scuffle of feet, and about half the congregation raced for the door, after which one soldier closed it. The others, with their machine guns trained on the congregation, set them down and said, Brethren, we've come to worship Christ with you, but first we had to get rid of the hypocrites. <laughs> what about you? Would you be in or out of that church? Are you someone that holds the truth of solus Christus? Because like Luther, it is your love and delight. And you cannot hide it. It breaks out. It shines forth. Because there is nothing more beautiful to you than your Savior and his word. It's what you cherish. And it's what you want everyone else to know. It's because there are those like that that there will be a Reformation 1000. And you know, today some of you are being called to put your faith in Christ, to renew your commitment to him. And my prayer is that you might say afresh with the Apostle Paul, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for me and everyone else who believes. For in it, God has shown me a way to be right with him according to what the Bible itself says. Well, as we conclude, you know how Luther concluded his life? Imagine being the man who single-handedly, unexpectedly, but in God's providence, changed the boundary lines of nations, started a movement that's alive to this day. A church was named for him, and he did not want it, but it was. People who believed his thoughts were called by his name, even though he didn't want that. He is someone who translated the Bible into the language of the people, spawning language translations of the Bible all around the world. He wrote hymns that are sung to this day. He is someone who allowed ministers to have wives, children, and grandchildren. Thank you, Martin Luther. What a great gift. All these blessings, they're all his. If they'd had copyright laws in his day, he would have died a billionaire. But he continued with his vow of poverty and owned nothing and gave all of his writings away. He helped write confessions of faith that are believed to this moment. And in God's providence, on church business, he was brought back to his birth town that would prove to be his death town as well. And he, feeling so very ill, he said, it's so tight in my chest. Some of us think he might have been having a heart attack. We don't know. But that evening, before they found him dead in his bed, he sat down and wrote his last words. What would you say about a man who had done so much to change the world? What would he say? Say, well, my legacy is great. I hope you'll take good care of it. Now, here were his words. Vir sent betler hoc est verum. German and Latin. We are beggars. This is true. He said, nothing can I bring to God. I can only come with my empty hands and say, may the wounds of Christ plead for me. 
I need a righteousness that's not my own. I've done all of this simply to thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. Do you have a Savior like that? Then don't be ashamed of him. Tell the world. Lord God, bless your word now as we conclude our fellowship. Would you grant your blessing, your grace, and encourage Believer's Chapel and its ministries? We thank you for the fact that the Reformation principles of the gospel are still alive and well with us. So Lord, put your blessing on these, your people. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.